Hello, I'm Chen Yu from University of Texas at Austin. The title of my talk is uh, Exploring New Frontiers in Cross-Directional Learning. We know that the learning world is a challenging task. Just uh, uh, take an example here. Imagine that uh, you are in a foreign country, you perceive a viral scene, and meanwhile you hear a continuous spoken utterance from a native speaker. Assuming that you can parse spatial scene into individual words and events, and you can segment continuous speech into individual words, you still need to find out which word goes to which object, which event. So this example shows we learn words in ambiguous context with the multiple words candidates for any referent and many referent candidates for any word. This problem is termed referential uncertainty problem in the literature. One solution that has been proposed recently to solve the referential uncertainty problem is termed cross-situational learning. The idea is that this indeterminacy problem may not need to be solved in a single ambiguous encounter, but cross-situationally, across multiple encounters and learning situations. Even a learner may not be able to figure out ball, boy, and dog in this one learning situation after being exposed to multiple learning situations. And if the learner can aggregate the statistical evidence across those situations, then the learner can figure out correct what reference mappings. Th this idea has been implemented by a cross-situational learning experimental paradigm that was first reported in 2007. In this experimental paradigm, there are multiple words and multiple objects in the learning situation. There, there are perfect mappings between words and objects. However, there's no information in the situation that tells learner which word goes to which object. However, across multiple learning situations, if the learner aggregates statistical evidence, then the learner can figure out the correct word reference mappings. Since the, the, the first experimental study, there have been many studies showing that both adults and young children calculate cross-situational statistics to pick out the right reference for each word at test. One question is, what's next? In this talk, I will present two research directions that we are actively pursuing in my lab. One is um, understanding cross-situational learning mechanisms, in particular through computational modeling approaches, and the other one is to examine how cross-situational learning solution can help learner to infer the meanings, but not just the reference of the word. And we will use verb learning as a case study. Now for first study, computational modeling. Computational models have been developed to study various aspects of cross-situational learning in particular and word learning more generally. Different from previous models, our, our aim here is to use realistic data in computational models. So the rationale of using realistic data is very well articulated in a recent review paper published in Cognition. Learning is a process whose outcome is sensitive to details of the input signal. If one makes even slightly incorrect assumptions about the input of the learning process, one ends up with studying a different learning problems together. So in our case, one question is what kind of data would be realistic? The data we have collected and used uh, in this study have uh, three critical properties. First, we want to use data from naturalistic contexts. In our case, we use data from child parents free-flowing toy play. Second, we want to use recent data, but not pre-processed data, nor symbolic representation. Third, we want to use data from the learner's point of view. This is a critical because information in the environment doesn't matter to learning. What matters to learning is the information that makes contacts through the learner's sensory system. So to, um, to collect data with those kind of properties, we use head-mounted eye tracking by putting head-mounted eye trackers on both the child and parents in free-flow interaction. And this is the example video used in this modeling work from, this is the egocentric video from the child view, crosshair indicate where the child learner look at moment by moment.
with such realistic data, we aim to answer two basic research questions in our first effort in this computational modeling approach. The first question is about the ideal learner question. That is, can models successfully acquire the associations between spoken word and visual object from raw video and speech data perceived by infant learner? The second question is about the infant learner question. That is, can a model predict which word is learned by the individual infants? So to answer the first question, um, we train a simulated learner, a model, using egocentric video at the learning moment. So this work is done by Satoshi, a graduate student at Indiana, and David Crandall, a collaborator in this project. So what we did was to extract image frames at the naming moment and use those frames at the naming moment as a training data for a computational model. So we train the model by using visual data at the naming moment, and then we test the model by um, providing a query image and ask the model to produce a name. And if the model successfully provides the corresponding target names, we would count it as a correct. And if the model fails to do so, we will count it as incorrect. Like this example here, the input image is a ladybug, and the model produces a round name helmet. And this is the result we got from this modeling effort. So we train the same model with either the child data or parents data. And we use the model trained based on parents' data as a baseline condition. We can see that compared with the baseline condition, the model trained based on child data performs significantly better with the x-axis, x -axis, which is the increase of the number of naming instances. The model trained based on child data from the child egocentric view improves performance dramatically from a little bit over 5% to close to 30%. So that allows us to answer the first question, the ideal learner question, that is raw sensory data perceived by the infant learner contains sufficient statistical information for what learning. Now, how about the second question, that can this model predict whether individual, which words are learned by the individual infant? To examine how much the model can simulate the infant learning, we need to know first whether how much infants learn from this kind of free-flowing interaction. To do so, we run another experiment in which we added a word learning test at the end of the free play. So in the word learning test uh, for individual trial, we just present two pictures on the screen and we measure infant looking behavior after hearing the target word. So this study was run by Sarah Schurz, who became expert at uh, putting head mounted eye trackers on both infants and adults and uh, testing word learning result at the end. So we test in this study, we test each word twice. So there are two test trials. They could, there could be three outcomes. One is the infant show learning in all two out of the testing trial. And the other one is uh, the other possibility they show learning for one out of two. And the third possibility is that uh, they fail to show learning in any um, testing trial. And this is the visualization of the result we have. Basically, we have uh, three um, possible categories for each word for each infant. And uh, blue means two out of two, white means one out of two, and uh, red means uh, zero out of two. So in the simulation study, we focus on the red ones and uh, blue ones because we know those are the instances that uh, we have a high certainty that whether either infants learn the target word or infants fail to learn the target word. So what we did in this study is uh, we feed the model with the naming instances from which infant learn the target word and the naming instances from which infant fail to learn the target word. And this work is done by Andre Amantoni. Um, he's a graduate student in my lab. So instead of training the model to learn the association between spoken word and visual object, here we actually train the model to differentiate the naming events from successful versus unsuccessful learning. It's a binary decision model needs to make. And this is actually a more challenging task if we think about this for a moment. This is an example. So we have two sets of image frames here. One set is from successful naming events, and the other set is from unsuccessful naming events. It's really hard to tell which set is from successful naming events. Nonetheless, when we train this with the model, 
we get uh, overall around 80% classification accuracy to separate the learned versus not learned instances. So basically what we found is a raw sensory data from the event egocentric view contain visual properties that can be used to differentiate the naming instances associated with the successful learning from naming instances that are associated with the unsuccessful learning. So to summarize this study here, infant learner here, that a trained model they, that can differentiate the frames associated with the successful and unsuccessful meaning, suggesting that naming instances from learned world contain certain visual properties relative to naming instances from uh, unlearned world. Now I'm going to move from modeling work to experimental study. And in this experimental study, we aim to understand how learners infer the meaning, but not just reference of words. Previous experimental studies demonstrate that human learners use cross-institutional statistics to infer the reference of word. However, even after identifying the target reference of a word, the learners still need to infer the meaning of the word from many possible meanings that can be derived from the same reference. And we know that verbs are universally harder to learn than nouns, precisely because many possible inductive generalizations can be made from a single event. Just take this example here. After observing this single event, learners may come up with several possible target verbs. So the target verbs could be turn, could be twist, could be spin, could be move, or it could be even play. And in fact, when we run this online study, this is a distribution of gases made by the Amazon Mechanical Turker after perceiving this visual event that I just showed you. And we can see there's a distribution here. Some people guess, guessed turn, some people guessed twist, some people guessed move, and so on, as we expected. And this is another uh, event. So what, what would you guess from this event? We found that um, some learners guessed hold, cut, and some others guessed the turn, pick, and uh, open. The correct answer for this one actually is a turn. So the question we want to ask here is that whether learners can rely on cross-situational statistics to infer the meaning of work from observing events like the two I showed you earlier. To do so, we adapt human simulation paradigm. The basic idea of the human simulation paradigm is to extract naming events uh, and replace um, the target word with a beep, and then ask a human learner to guess the meaning of the beep. Compared with the original human simulation paradigm, we made two changes. One is that we use the egocentric video collected from the infant learner. Um, instead of using the third person video. The other one is that we um, design experiment with a sequence of learning situations, but not just a single learning situation. So this is how our experiment look like. The learners perceive a sequence of uh, learning situations and the learner will ask to guess the meaning of the event, meaning of the word. So next one. Next one, and so on. So the two questions we have in mind for the first study is that uh, are first, whether learners can learn the meaning of target board from sequence of learning situation. The second one is, uh, if so, how they gradually converge to one meaning by aggregating statistical information across multiple learning situations. So this is the result we have from this experiment. This is from the very first trial. There's no cross-situational learning yet. As we expected, the learner made several guesses with a, um, multiple um, unique words. And this is the result from the end of the third trial. We can see that the learner select one target word more twist than other words. And this is the result at the end of the sixth trial we can see that learner gradually can watch to two plausible targets, one is twist and one is turn. 
to show how learning can work in space and time, we visualize the result based on semantic similarity. This is my favorite plot. Here's how to read it. So individual dots indicate individual words. The size of the dot indicates the proportion of guesses learners made. Color indicates how close is to ground truth. In this example, the target verb is turn, so it's in red. And then twist is very close to turn semantically, and therefore twist has this reddish color. But some other guesses like push or fix, they are not that close. That's the reason they are in black. And distance indicates semantic similarity. So this is the result we have from trial one that people made uh, different guesses, and some are close to the target, and some are not so close. And this is what happened at the end of the trial three. We can see that um, people gradually count to two possible candidates, turn and twist. And they still made some other guesses, but the size of those dots are very small. And this is what happened at trial six. Not only we saw very few uh, dots, but also that um, those dots are really also close, those guesses are really close to the ground truth term. So we have spin and the row, they're very close semantically to the target meaning. And in a follow-up study, we want to examine the role of linguistic information in cross-situational learning. So we, we use the same video clips, but instead of using a single beep, we replace a beep with um, a, a context frame. So this is an example. Look, his feet. So the linguistic context here provides both semantic and syntactic information that may help learner to improve learning. If you it, it makes noise. And this is the example with the target word is eat, which is really hard one. We can tell because from trial one, we can see there are um, a, a, a long list of target words that uh, people get to start with. But then statistical learning works because at the end of trial six, 60% 60 people can watch to the target eat. And we compare that with the statistical learning, cross computer learning with the linguistic information. And we find that at the end of trial six, um, the learner can get uh, 80% um, accuracy on target. And this is a quantitative result by uh, aggregating results we have from um, 11 target words. So we can see that from 12.1 to 12.6, for cross-institutional learning only without linguistic skill, the performance improved from 20% to 40%. For cross-institutional learning with linguistic skills, the performance improved from 50% to up to 80%. To summarize this talk, for the computational modeling direction, computational models using realistic data show that information encoded in raw sensory data is sufficient for learning word object associations and for differentiating between successful versus unsuccessful naming events. This direction will allow us to not only understand the underlying mechanisms that support cross-institutional learning, but also examine how cross-institutional learning works, not just in the lab, but also in the real world. For word learning experiments, we show that cross-institutional learning can be used for inferring not only just the reference of word, but also the meaning of the word. This direction will allow us to go deeper on word learning and go beyond object name learning. So I want to thank all the collaborators in those two projects I present, and also I want to thank the funding agency to support this research. And thank you for your attention.